Kia ora and uh, good evening everybody and uh, welcome to um, this evening's uh, Auckland Conversations. Um, on behalf of Auckland Council and our sponsors, I'd like to welcome you warmly to um, an evening with uh, Charles Montgomery and the Auckland Conversations series and the uh, evening is entitled Happy City. Um, my name is Ludo Campbell-Reed, I'm the Council's Urban Design Champion and I'm the new General Manager of the Auckland Design Office. Um, a new team set up to drive the design agenda across the council, the organization, and hopefully the country. Um, really proud to be hosting tonight's uh, series, um, and in partnership with our colleagues at the New Zealand Planning Institute, who, who currently are co-hosting uh, an international planning conference uh, entitled Back to the Future. And uh, as you've been um, sort of loitering and talking outside, and gathering, you can see the incredible displays and the stories that have been told through the planning conversation um, outside the, the, this building. So it's been really great working with you guys at the NZPI, so thank you very much, it's been a real privilege. So as I said, I'm the, uh, also the general manager for the Auckland Design Office, but I'm also the sponsor uh, of these Auckland Conversation series. Um, really very proud to, to be that, and uh, they're designed to inspire, uh, to influence, to inform and to challenge your thinking. And I'd like to thank uh, Susan Quinn and her team, who, who every time she just nails it with her team, who do a fantastic job. So I, I wouldn't mind if you would, would you all put your hands together for Susan Quinn and her team. <laughs> Woo! Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors, um, obviously, who without, this, without them, these conversations would not be possible. Um, we run these on a tight budget, and it's uh, fantastic to have them supporting us. So you can see their um, uh, names on the screen, hopefully. Here they go. Um, I'd like to make a particular thanks to Rosine, who've been with us for some time now as our sort of principal sponsor, and also of the, uh, the Auckland Council stand, which you see um, out the front. So there's a whole range of exciting things and goodies. I'd really encourage you to get out there and have a look at the, um, particularly the large sort of digital display. It's fantastic and tells an incredible story about what's happening. And I think Aucklanders could be really proud about the city that they see changing in front of their, their very eyes. I'd like to thank again the NZPI, the New Zealand Planning Institute, for all their, their support. Um, it's been great sort of partnering and working with these, uh, with these guys uh, to bring these speakers to New Zealand. And I'd like to lastly thank uh, MR Cagney for coming on board as a, a program sponsor and supporting us in, in that way. And uh, it's good to have uh, these guys, one of the sort of top caliber companies out there working to drive a more people-friendly city. So um, that's it in terms of the beginning. The, 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 the role of the um, Auckland Design Office, as I, I mentioned, I'm the new general manager for, is, is to drive that design-led city agenda across the city. And um, working with the public, the private sector, and the community of Auckland to, to realize the, the vision of Auckland becoming the world's most livable city. And I just think that Auckland has really got a bit of swagger back. I think it's got a bit of confidence that's emerging. The projects that you see materializing in front of your eyes is showing a very different city. And it's really exciting and a real privilege to be part of that. One of the new projects within the Auckland Design Office um, remit is this sense of activation, bringing some vibrancy and bringing buzz back to our city center. And uh, recently at the Auckland anniversary weekend, we uh, tried out this idea of activation, temporary activation, bringing projects to fruition, but projects which have a DNA of the future. So thinking about the concepts of next 10 years, but actually delivering that over a, a short time frame or a weekend. And, and doing trials. If we get it wrong, we change. If we learn, we maneuver and we, we alter our program. So I'd just like to cue a quick video. Guys, if you're still there in the back. This is really uh, the celebrating Auckland's 175th birthday, um, so uh, that's the big event for this weekend. Oh, there's multiple things going on. Queen's Wharf is, you know, buzzing away with all sorts of things down there for kids and families. Ports of Auckland have closed down um, some of their areas. The, an international buskers event happening this weekend as well, so they're popping up left, right, and centre. So it's good times. I think it's brilliant. Yeah, absolutely love it. It's a cool place to come and chill out and eat some lunch and just relax. Our little part is closing down Lower Queen Street. 
and uh, just letting people lounge on, on deck chairs and on the bean bags. We've got um, food stalls. Being able to walk along the waterfront like that is just, yeah. just amazing. Yeah, it's what Auckland needs, definitely. Yeah, so we're down here to, to talk to the people and see what they like about what's going on in the city at the moment. And really, the other thing is testing some ideas down in Lower Queen Street. where people can sort of sit down and let the kids have a bit of a play. I like seeing all the big towers. The feedback that we've been getting so far is really, you know, they're loving the event and they love the idea of closing down Queen Street and, and opening up for people. They want more events, they want markets, um, they, they want connection to the water. That feedback's not just like Queen Street, it's about this whole downtown area and the waterfront. It's just awesome, it's even better because we've got a little one here so she loves it. When the World Cup was here it was the same thing, it was obviously a lot more crowded but you know, it showed it could work, you know, that people can come together in a city like this and actually not cause any bother. Oh, amazing. I think it's one of the best events I've been to so far in Auckland. We've got a whole lot of whiteboards around here that we're asking people just to write what they think about those ideas or anything else that they want to say about what's going right or wrong in the city. We're taking photographs of that feedback. Then we'll wipe it clean and then the next lot of people can come in there and, and write their thing as well. Um, and it's working really, really well. We're just From 9 o'clock through to 6 o'clock we've got people here writing things. Um, it's good for the kids. <laughs> they, they love it. It's always been a, a city of opportunity for, for most people and a lot more people are coming in which is proving that. The sun, the greenery, everything. I love its contours. I like the way you can ride really fast down a hill and then you have to slog it up. This is my home, you know, I love, I love Auckland. It's so international but it's also quite accepting to all the cultures so you can see a lot of different nationalities around here. I really enjoy that, how it mixes all together. Yeah, no, I love it, there's heaps going on, heaps happening, always something to do. We moved here about five years ago and I think we made a good decision. I'm planning to stay forever. There we go. I, I just want to say, it's, um, again, it's not just our team. It's, it's always going to be a massive collaborative effort between the entire organisation, uh, the whole council family and the, and the public and the, the community to get these projects delivered. So it's not easy, um, but more and more as we practice these temporary activations, the better we'll get at them and the quicker they'll happen, the cheaper they'll happen, and the more impactful they'll be. And I, I think there's that, that great Frank Sinatra song, uh, The Best Is Yet To Come. Um, so we're just kind of getting going. So look, um, that gives you a taste of, of, of where we're at, and uh, I think it shows you the, the excitement that the Auckland public have for the city that they have, and I think people are falling back in love with Auckland. Um, so there's a, a concept there. So. I'm the hors d'oeuvre this morning, um, well, this afternoon, and um, the, the main course is, is our uh, guest tonight, um, Charles. So I'd like to um, just briefly introduce Charles. Charles Montgomery, he writes, experiments, and creates transformative conversations about cities, science, and human well-being. His latest book, Happy City, examines the intersection between urban design and the emerging science of happiness. The book shows the striking ways that our cities can influence our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions, as it offers a vision for urban renovations guided by evidence from around the world. The message is as surprising as it is hopeful. Charles has won numerous awards for his writing on urban planning, psychology, culture, and history in magazines and journals on three continents. His first book, The Last Heathen, published internationally as The Shark God, won the 2005 Charles Taylor Prize for Literary Nonfiction and the Hubert Evans Prize for Nonfiction, and was shortlisted for two Writers' Trust of Canada Awards. Among his numerous awards is a citation of merit from the Canadian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society for outstanding contribution towards public understanding of climate change science. Charles has advised planners, students, and policymakers across Canada, the US, and England. 
He has also used his insights in happiness science to drive high-profile experiments that help citizens transform their relationships with each other and their cities. In 2010, his Home for the Games initiative tested the limits of trust, enabling hundreds of residents to open up their homes to strangers during the Vancouver Winter Olympics. Working with the BMW Guggenheim Lab, psychologist Colin Ellard and the citizens of New York City, he used mobile phone applications to map the emotions of public space in the Lower East Side. At the Museum of Vancouver and elsewhere, Charles and his collaborators create participatory programs that help citizens treat their cities as hands-on laboratories. <laughs> I don't know what I meant to dance or do something like Farrell, but I won't. Charles spends most of his time in East Vancouver and Mexico City. And this week, he's here with us in Auckland. And uh, Charles, it's been a, a real privilege. You've worked your socks off the last three days. He's been on television, on Q&A. He's been on Radio New Zealand. He's been working with, with my team, with collaborative, cross-collaborative teams across the organization to talk a little, talk about the concepts of happiness and how we bring those into our programs. And it's been brilliant having you here, Charles. The, the, the story is only half finished. And uh, I'm really thrilled and looking forward to your presentation tonight. So would you all put your hands together and welcome Charles Montgomery. I'm not going to dance. I'm, I'm not going to dance with you, Ludo. <laughs> it's a bit weird, wouldn't it? Give me a hug instead. That's cool. Good luck. Um, I forgot to put in the contract that we've banned Pharrell from uh, further happiness talks. Um, I'm feeling immensely grateful right now, and um, I think it comes down to about uh, an hour and a half ago, I had my first half hour break in the last few days, and I just decided to take a wander and scowl at anybody who came close to me so I wouldn't have to chat. And, uh, you know, the storm had just passed, and I was walking through downtown, uh, outside of the square here, through some of the shared spaces, and the students were out, you know, whistling at each other, teenagers being obnoxious, birds flying from tree to tree and doing their chirpy thing, and the sky opened up, and the breeze was in my hair, and I reached the, um, the scramble. Uh, we call it a Texas scramble over on Queen Street, you know, when the lights turn and everybody's heading in every direction. And I just felt this immense sense of freedom a sense of freedom in this city, that the city was mine, and I, I just can't wait to see what it, it uh, offers in the next few days, but I, mean, I don't know if you ever have that sense, but it's a, for me, it's a wonderful feeling, and the only place I get it is on top of a mountain or in the middle of a city. So um, I just wanted to thank all of you who have been shelp it, uh, shaping this central city uh, for giving me that experience, and I can't wait for more. Now... Um, I often feel some responsibility at these talks to make everybody happy, and it, it's quite a burden. And so I've decided to kind of reject that and, um, and start with a sad story. Uh, by the way, was anybody here at uh, the talk this morning? Put up your hands. Good, because I'm telling the same story. <laughs> good, good. Um, okay, this is serious. So here's my story. In the summer of 1996, a devastating heat wave hit the U.S. Midwest including and especially the city of Chicago. It was so hot, the streets were buckling. People were forcing open fire hydrants in order to cool down and throwing rocks at the service uh, people who came to turn them off again. Uh, apartments baked. And by the time a mid-July weekend arrived, people started to die. In the course of three days, more than 700 people died in Chicago. Now, at that time, a young epidemiologist named Jan Semenza was training at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. And uh, he was sent up to Chicago to figure out you know, what was going on, what, was the, um, what were the public health correlates of this heat death epidemic. He was just training. This was new for him. So they hit Chicago, he and his wife and the rest of their team, and they started knocking on doors. And the first door they knocked on was a residential hotel where someone had died on a higher floor. And uh, they made their way into the lobby, and uh, the heat was pressing down on them. You know, sweat was pouring off everyone's faces. The lobby was red. It was like entering the jaws of some giant beast. And they interviewed the manager there, and they said, um, so what can you tell us about this fellow who died? And the manager said, um, nothing. Well, surely you knew him. Not really. Well, he must have had some friends. 
Well, talk to them. No, he didn't have friends. Visitors, no. Family, no. And finally, the manager just lost his patience and he said, don't you understand what I'm telling you? This guy knew nobody. He was a nobody. A nobody. As hard as that was for Semenza to hear, um, how tragic it was, he heard the same story again and again and again as he and his team fanned out across Chicago to understand these heat deaths. So the dead who were carried out had lots in common. Many were poor. Many didn't have air conditioning. But the one thing they all seemed to have in common was social disconnection. In fact, it was so bad that the city had to hire a fleet of refrigerated trucks to carry the bodies away because <clears throat> there was nobody else there to care for them. So, as the bodies were carried away and trucked off into the distance to some distant morgue, I don't know, Semenza was left with this terrible sense of, of dread and sadness about this country he had come to. And in fact, this disconnection that occurred in Chicago, you can see it all across North America. You can see it all across many modern cities. And it's a burden Semenza carried with him for quite a while until I met him, actually, many years later. So how are you feeling? That's my sad story. And I'm going to come back to Jan later. I mention this story in particular because it carries one of the most important messages about happiness in cities. Happiness in cities. So this is the happy story I came to tell you about. Uh, and so we will, I will finish Jan's story. Don't worry, it's not a horrible ending. But the point is, I met him during... Uh, my work trying to understand this intersection between urban design and the science of happiness. And the evidence has convinced me that our cities, they change the way we feel, they change the way we move, they change the way we treat each other in ways most of us don't even realize. So I've concluded the evidence um, points to this notion that not only can cities make us happy, but cities should make us happy. That's their job. And this is not a kooky idea. I'm not talking about, you know, rainbows and hugs here, although hugs may be part of the solution. Um, some of our greatest thinkers for the past couple of thousand years have been advocating for this very thing. The city should make people happier. Policy should make people happier. And it's a reasonable thing to pursue in your own lives. You know, Aristotle was calling for this in the, out in the Agora in ancient Greece. Uh, 2,000 years ago, Freud pointed out that happiness is the end result of, or the objective of everything we do, even if your goal is to kind of be miserable, uh, you know, sitting at home on the toilet or something, uh, that's happiness for you. The Americans have woven this notion into their constitution. Everybody has the right to pursue it. So as inspiring as that idea is, it leaves us with the question, what do we mean by happiness? What is this thing? And this is a question our, the greatest thinkers have been trying to figure out for at least several hundred years, particularly since the Enlightenment. And um, it didn't go well. So in the 1700s, they basically tried to figure out, no, you can't see that yet. They tried to figure out what this thing of happiness was. Can you measure it? Can you measure ple uh, pleasure and pain? They gave it their best shot and they failed. They just didn't have the tools. So economists stepped up and said, don't worry, we got this one. Maybe they used a different expression. Um, and the economist said, you can't measure happiness, so instead let's find a proxy for it. Let's look and watch how people spend their money, and that will tell us what makes them happy. So you know where that's gotten us, right? We have a system now where earthquakes, divorce, cancer, these things are supposed to increase happiness because they produce economic activity. What a bummer, hey? But the economists are coming around. So this is what I wanted to show you. The economists have now adopted, um, at least some of them, a way of thinking where they're lo actually looking for evidence. They're trying to understand how we react, uh, how we manage risk and reward. And the Nobel Prize winning economist, Gary Becker, came up with this baby. And this is, really, this is a really great equation. It tells you the, the current state of thinking in behavioral economics. I'm going to translate it for you. Uh, I know there's an economist in the room, so don't correct me, please. Um, this says, you're going to try and get happy by buying lots of stuff and building your own uh, personal status. 
uh, and that's going to be okay for a little while until it stops working. It's going to stop working because as soon as you get there, as soon as you achieve what you want, you've got your big house, your big screen TV, and your, um, your uh, I don't know, a speaking gig in Auckland, then the, the happiness horizon recedes. And this is the way we are programmed, actually. So what they're saying is you can't win, you can never get there. But unfortunately, their model is very narrow. They're, su they're suggesting the evolutionary happiness fun function is only looking through at happiness through that idea of acquisition and status. Fortunately, other uh, researchers and scientists have been looking for evidence on this question of happiness um, in the human body. We're getting lessons from public health, from neuroscience, yes, behavioral economics, psychology, and the lesson's pretty interesting. The first thing they've learned is that um, happy people are happy. Now, that doesn't seem like a big thing to learn, but actually it is a really big thing to learn. What they're learning is that uh, people who self-report on happiness uh, actually have higher levels of um, uh, uh, activity in the pleasure centers of their brains and lower levels of stress hormones coursing through their system. People who self-report as happy are less likely to check into hospital or to uh, psych wards. They're more productive at work. They live longer. Their communities are more resilient. Uh, so maybe Aristotle was right. This idea of the pursuit of happiness is a good thing. It does still leave us with the question, what do we mean by happiness in terms of what are, what are its constituents? If we want to build a happier society or a happier city, what do we need to do? Well, what I've tried to do uh, is draw lessons from those disciplines I mentioned and come up with some, something of a recipe for uh, a happier city. And I'm going to whip you through that before coming back to some stories, okay? Uh, it's important that we just acknowledge that you can't get to the happy city if you're not meeting people's core needs. So when we do our workshops in Mexico City and we try and talk to them about, you know, having a sense of mastery, the people are like, whoa, 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 whoa. We need to we stop right there at security. That's all we want to talk about. Okay, so moving past that, indeed, they were right in the Enlightenment. It's way better to feel pleasure than pain. Uh, feeling healthy is important. Notice I said feeling healthy. Uh, you can feel healthy until the second you keel over, and that is a good life. Um, income matters. The economists were actually pretty right on this one. It's so much better to be rich than to be poor, but if you're concerned about societal happiness, unless you're in the USA, income isn't as important as equity. So the more equal country and the more equal cities are happier places. Uh, from psychology, we're learning it's important for people to have a, a sense of mastery, the idea that life or the city is not crushing you. Think of the traffic jam, right? A sense of freedom to live and move as you wish. But I'm going to add to freedom uh, the responsibility to pay for your choices, to pay the true cost, to internalize those externalities, which you're not doing here in Auckland all the time, uh, and neither are we in Vancouver. A sense of meaning and belonging. A meaning in your life, the work you're doing is important, your relationships are important, and you're connected to your place. And all of these, all of these elements of well-being are joined by one ring which shall join them all, which is... That's my only Lord of the Rings reference, okay? <laughs> so I won't. Um, social ties. Nothing matters more to human happiness than our relationships with the people we love and, in fact, everyone else in the city. So let me show you some evidence to prove my point that the happy city is above all a social city. All those other things mat matter. We can talk about them at, over beers later, but from now on, it's the social city for the next uh, half hour. So some evidence. Looking at the relationship between life satisfaction and social trust in Canadian cities, the economists, behavioral economists, you know, the happiness guys, have found this really powerful correlation. So cities that say, uh, where people say they can trust their neighbors are much happier than cities where people don't express as much social trust. What's interesting here is up there, St. John is a humble little backwater. Nothing's really going on there. I can't say that in Canada. Um, Canada's Big, rich cities are down here. Vancouver, Toronto, Calgary. What's going on? This does not mean that money doesn't matter. It really does. It means that social relationships are matter even more. They completely overpower the effect of wealth in cities. Uh, people who are socially connected, 
who have strong relationships with family, friends, and community, like my Mexican in-laws, look at them partying it up there. It's the booze, it's the tacos, but mostly it's the getting together. They live an average of 15 years longer than people who are socially disconnected. And all those other things I told you about happy people, those correlates of happiness, they apply most of all to people who are socially connected. They're more productive, they're healthier, they survive disease, uh, and they get uh, more done at work, and they, um, ah, they're happier too. So um, I think it's important when we're speaking about cities to remember that relationships matter, but the value we place on our relationships with family and friends, needs to be complemented with our relationship with everybody else in the city. And here's an example of that. So Ludo mentioned I worked with the BMW Guggenheim Lab in, in New York City. And this was a, uh, a change lab. We worked in an empty lot in the Lower East Side. We had three months to play and lots of money from BMW. So we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of parties too. Uh, they kept calling it a lab. So I said, great, I get to conduct some experiments, many of which I'll tell you about later. But uh, here's one. We had parties. At this particular party, we uh, pulled people out of the crowd and said, hey, you know, can we get your picture? Over here, please. And we'd pull them aside and we'd say, well, actually, um, we need to get your picture taken with a complete stranger. So we'd call over a complete stranger and we'd say, now, here's the deal. You have to uh, introduce yourselves, say something nice about each other. Um, and now what we need you to do is pose as though you are old friends being reunited after many years. So what would that picture look like? Well, here's what these grumpy New Yorkers did. They got so into it. These are complete strangers connecting just for a moment. And you know, I was really kind of touched by it. So they all loved it. They all had a great time. But that wasn't the experiment. The experiment was then to ask them the standard social trust question, which is, if you dropped your wallet somewhere out in the city tonight or your purse, what are the chances you'd get it back if a stranger found it? Uh, what we found was that these people who had a superficial trust-building encounter with a complete stranger didn't just feel good. They expressed more trust for everybody in the entire city, which is a big deal in New York. So why is that a good thing? Well, number one, it feels good. You get a hit of oxytocin, you know, the, the warm, fuzzy uh, trust hormone. Feels great. Um, it's also more accurate. So uh, we're, all, we're usually wrong when we assess the social trust of everybody in society. We can trust people much more than we think we can. People actually do return those wallets. Uh, but one other reason, social trust is the driver of economic activity and creativity and collaboration. You see it in nations where trusting countries are richer, this is showing correlation, not causation, right? Richer countries also often end up being more trusting because uh, there, it tends to be less at stake for each relationship. Um, but it, it happens on a city level as well. We're getting more patent applications, more GDP growth in cities where people are meeting face-to-face -face in trust-building ways. It, the internet isn't good enough. So it's important to remember when this conversation comes up that uh, if somebody says you, you thinks you're talking about rainbows and, and unicorns, to point out, no, we're talking about ec economic activity in our city as well. Here's the issue, though. Our cities are designing our social lives. They're designing relationships and trust in or out of our lives. So how is that happening? Well, more evidence. Uh, number one, people are reporting the longer their commutes, the less happy they are. And that is not a big, stupid, duh thing to learn, because this graph is not telling you about how much someone's commute sucks. What it's telling you is people who are choosing longer commutes for a bigger house or a better paying job um, are actually reporting lower life satisfaction. They're less happier on the whole. So those choices they're making, you're not balancing out the, the utility. The economist's wrong again. We're not good at maximizing utility as, uh, as individuals. So why are these long commutes making people less happy? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, say yes if you can relate to this guy. Three of you can, come on. Uh, I, I really can. I feel like this is the person I'm growing into every time I get into uh, the driver's seat. People are reporting much higher levels of, um, of rudeness and incivility when they're driving in their cars than in any other way of moving around the city. That includes on transit. Why? Because when we meet face to face, we communicate with our facial expression and with our eyes. And you just can't do that using your headlights. Okay? 
But that's only part of the reason uh, that the long commute is driving unhappiness. Um, I've talked this one through three times in the past two days, so I'm going to give it a hero's shot. Some really smart geographers have punched in data for all the big U.S. cities, and their premise is this. Two people want to get together after work in the city for an hour and a half window, theoretically. How are they going to do that? Well, they need to move through the space-time continuum. Hmm? All right? So you need to move across space and you need to move through time. This is a three-dimensional thing. So we each have a, um, let's say I want to meet you, I have a prism of opportunity in space and time. And if mine doesn't intersect with yours, forget it. We're not having a beer. Not going to happen. So what the geographers found was, when they punched in this data, was uh, there are many factors ab affecting our ability to get together, but the most important of all, they call um, dispersal. So the degree to which a city has pushed various functions out across the miles. So dispersal, what does that look like? Here we are in Florida, uh, where we live over here, we sh shop over there, the school's over here, uh, there's some green space over there, and a freeway um, tying it all up into knots. We've been doing this all over the world, particularly in rich cities for, for 70 years, and it's really hard to put the brakes on that system. As you know here in Auckland, uh, this is, uh, help me pronounce this, Huapai. This is your special housing area, one of them anyway. This is one uh, of those areas way out on the fringe. And we can talk about your mechanisms and why this is happening later, but the fact is, this is dispersal. The people who are buying homes out here, without realizing it, are locking themselves into an arrangement, locking themselves into a spatial arrangement with the rest of the city that they're going to pay for in ways they don't understand. So, Huapai again, I tried to uh, get a Google Earth image uh, where I could uh, have, you know, uh, Auckland, you know, in the distance, and I couldn't. It's Auckland uh, CBD is over the horizon on this one. But here we have this spatial arrangement, okay? So what are the system effects of uh, living this way? Uh, let's compare two different community systems, and we're going to pick on the USA now, all right? So uh, on the left, we have auto-dependent single-use dispersal, right? This is single-family homes. You've got to drive. In fact, if you go to Mableton, this is outside of Atlanta, and try and go from one place to another on Google, it says, warning, no sidewalks. Um, over on the right, you have closer into the central city, a mixed-use, uh, walkable community, fine street grid, you can walk to everything, it's all nearby, uh, and uh, kind of a nice place to live, actually. Uh, but some people think they're both nice. So, what are the system effects? Number one, uh, community on the left emits twice as much greenhouse gas emissions. Um, if you look at policy around the world now, it's as if we don't even give a damn about greenhouse gas emissions, so we're going to skip to the next slide. Um, system effects. Homeowners in Auckland's fringe are saving up to $50,000 a year. Wrong. By the way, is that reporter here? If you're here, you're a deep shed, okay? That's just wrong, wrong, wrong. And I, I'll tell you why it's wrong. <laughs> Sorry, that was rude. If you're here, let's have a beer and just chat. Okay, sorry. Just bring it down, Ludo. Bring it down. It's about hugs and dancing. So um, I read this story, and uh, they compared the uh, cost of housing and mortgage to someone's uh, transit pass for a year or something. We know if you look at system effects, uh, families out on this fringe are going to have to own an extra car. Their transport expenses are going to be double that of people who live in the core. You're going to have to own one or more, two more cars. That's $10,000 a year extra in most countries, probably more here, because of your gas taxes. So very expensive, terrible place to be poor. In fact, a warning from the USA. Again, I spent time in the exurbs of Southern California, the ground zeros of the housing crisis in the USA. Guess who lost their homes first? It was these people living on the fringe. Why? Because they were all paying something like eight or $900 a month in transportation expenses. Beware. Okay, um, 10 pounds heavier because you're stuck in your car, you can't walk anywhere. You're going to die three to five years sooner. We didn't come to talk about any of this. This is what I wanted to talk about. People who are on the exurban edge in these car-dependent neighborhoods are reporting, this is not my opinion, they're reporting lower levels of social trust in their neighbors, they're less likely to know and trust their neighbors, less likely to have neighbors over for dinner, less likely to play team sports, volunteer, read the paper, or even vote. 
They're not antisocial people. The city is stealing time. Stealing time. And it's stealing time from their relationships too. If you have more than a 40-minute commute, surveys are now suggesting, uh, longitudinal study actually is suggesting that you are uh, 45% more likely to be divorced after 10 years. This distance is, is tearing our lives apart. So, what's the challenge? I think everybody here acknowledges the, uh, the special challenge here in Auckland and elsewhere. It's how can we enable, not force, more people to live closer together in connected communities that rewards them for proximity. Um, the bad news is it's, it's actually not that easy because we do have a special challenge. And the special challenge is this. Um, well, I just want to ask you, are there any people out there who actually live in a, a dense, connected downtown environment who may have been feeling smug in the last 10 minutes? If you're feeling smug, put up your hand, please. Yeah, you're a downtown latte-sipping elite. That's what our mayor, Rob Ford, called you. Um, so, you know, I, felt, I, I used to feel smug as well, but the truth is surveys are showing that... Um, People who live in towers, particularly residential towers, are, the, are, are just as uh, likely to express uh, levels of social trust and neighborhood connections as people on the exurban fringe. In fact, they're the most likely to report feeling lonely and crowded at the very same time. This is even true in Vancouver, where you, you know, you've all been hearing about our, our um, Vancouverist, high status, high amenity, high fun residential downtown. Come on up, I'll show you around, it's quite pretty. However, the Vancouver Foundation has identified the, big, the burning issue in our city, other than affordability, is social disconnection. And where is ground zero of that feeling of disconnectedness? It's here in the tower neighborhoods. People in towers are reporting feeling um, less, sort of left, less love from the neighbors, less favors being done, less uh, knowing of neighbors, less trust. So what's going on here in the tower environment? Um, let me give you an example of, uh, of one um, little investigation we did. We're not doing peer-reviewed research, I'm just a guy, but I'm curious, uh, as we all have the right to be. So this is the 501, one of the early Vancouver's towers. You see the typology, tall and skinny, so everybody gets a view. It's got a, a low podium in front of uh, street edge uh, activation, you know, small businesses, kind of Jane Jacobsy, kind of great. Three-story um, townhouses above that. Okay, there's a the typology. On the third story balcony, you have a garden and a volleyball court, because that was super cool in the late 90s when they built it. Now I'm going to introduce you to Rob, a total sweetheart who ran for city council, but he wasn't outgoing enough, so he didn't win. Rob bought a place up in the tower when it was first built. He loved it. He had all his friends over. They had dinner parties. It was so cool. He could look out over the city and feel superior. Um, or not. And, um, but then his, his friends would leave, and he'd be there in his apartment, and it would still be okay. And he realized after a few months, he wasn't connecting with a single person in his building. Not that he really wanted to, but he noticed down on the volleyball court, there always seemed to be, you know, Friday night cocktail parties and fun going on, and he wasn't a part of it. So who was down there? Well, he had a friend who moved into a townhouse and said, oh yeah, we just claimed that space, we're having a great time. So Rob sold his condo up above, moved to the townhouses below, because it was still cheap back then, nobody wanted those townhouses. And uh, he was invited into, you know, the landscape of fun. Within weeks, he was going to the parties. Within months, he knew all his neighbors' names. Uh, a few years later, he, you know, he's got keys for his neighbors' houses. He babysits their kids. They all go on vacation together. I said, Rob, how many of these people would you say you loved? And so there's about 24 neighbors, right? And he said, uh, like family, maybe six. Now, considering the average American says they can only trust or confide in 1.5 people on the planet. <laughs> this is a remarkable thing. Six close friends, close by. It might be too much for some people. So what's going on here? And that's okay, right? Live in the tower. Um, what's going on? There's, there's design at play. So I, I understand Jan Gell came to visit, so let's just quote some Jan Gell. We have people with their uh, very short, maybe two and a half meter uh, front decks here, a soft zone to interact. And we know from Jan's work on Danish and Canadian cities, he was actually studying activity in front yards and found that the most activity happening happened, that means, you know, just chatting with people or whatever, 
when the yard was um, 10.8 feet, which is what, about three and a half meters deep? Am I right? Ish. Anyway, uh, so you have this soft zone, and it's quite amazing when you have that ability to advance or retreat as you wish, people end up building these superficial bonds which deepen over time. So that's one thing. There's another thing going on, and I think it has to do with social scale. I talked to the evolutionary anthropologist Robin Dunbar about this, and he kind of straightened me out. Um, ever heard of Dunbar's number? I should really ask people to make a sound when I ask a question. Say yes if you've heard about Dunbar's number. Yes, three of you. So he basically had this crazy theory, but which seems to be um, bearing out in, in uh, social surveys, about the brain's capacity to uh, figure out how many people you can trust in your life. And it's an unconscious calculation we do all the time. And he's basically saying, you know, we, none of us can have more than 150 friends, no matter what Facebook says. It's just, you, you can't handle it. It's too much. Anyway, what Dunbar suggests is that you're doing that unconscious calculation all the time. So in this case, where Rob was dealing with, say, 24 neighbors, um, it was pretty easy for the brain to go, yeah, I'll talk to that person again because I'll probably see them again. Uh, maybe I'll be nice to them and take their key. Over in the tower, you had more than 300 people funneling through the elevator. And we all know that if you're not sure if you'll see someone again. You know, why make the effort? So uh, this, is, this is what Dunbar's point was. And uh, so there's a question of social scale here. And maybe we need to get better at creating smaller residential clusters in the denser city. That means maybe, in some cases, going beyond the lazy response of just building a tower and looking at more row houses, uh, stacked townhouses, courtyard arrangements, and maybe even intervening in our single-family neighborhoods. Now, I know people in single-family neighborhoods. You know, I, I live in a single-family neighborhood myself, and anytime somebody wants to bring the density to our community, you know, we, we get the pitchforks and torches out, right? And, and the truth is, we all need to acknowledge that our neighborhoods have actually, actually been emptying out of people for three decades. The average household size used to be between five and seven people. In New Zealand, it's now 2.7. So don't kid yourself. There are fewer cars in some cases, but certainly fewer people. Let's re-inhabit those neighborhoods. In Vancouver, number one, not only do you get to have a granny suite uh, in your basement, so two households per single family lot, now we brought in uh, what may be the biggest urban infill project in North America. Every single family household gets to turn their garage into uh, another little house, little cottage. And uh, I know architects love to add their renderings in back here, but actually in some cases the people are appearing in the back alleys. Um, so it's very cool. Anyway, we're re-inhabiting re these neighborhoods and you'd never know it, particularly because we have enough density. These people don't even need to buy cars, so they're not going to take your parking spot. Don't worry about it. Okay, keeping, keeping it down, Ludo. It's just calm. Um, okay, here we have uh, my mother in a great public space. And what I want to say is that uh, we all know that in the denser, more connected city, public space is becoming our living room. You know, I felt it today on your shared spaces. So I was very interested to see, to gather some evidence to see the effect that public space has on the way people felt and treated other people. So again, playing at the lab in New York City. BMW, give us some money. I brought down Colin Ellard, who's a neuroscientist from uh, the University of Waterloo, and we created a psychophysiological tour of the Lower East Side. Uh, I'll just break that down for you. We tested two things. Uh, Colin brought his skin conductance monitors. These measure your level of arousal, not sexual arousal, just excitement as you move through the city. And that can be positive or negative. He also hacked some blackberries, which was an amazing Canadian invention, which you've probably thrown away now, um, to take a, a subjective response on, um, on happiness. How, how happy do you feel right now? And then we wandered people through the neighborhood. We learned a lot of things. Here's one that's significant, I think, for most uh, cities where we're re-inhabiting downtowns. People expressed much higher levels of happiness here on this jumbled up, messy, dirty old tenement block than just down the street, here in front of this exemplary, award-winning, mixed-use development. So it's a great development. You've got social housing and market housing above and kale, food, uh, kale foods, whole foods inside. <laughs> Sorry, I love kale. I really miss my kale. Um, anyway, I, lo I loved eating there. But the, you see what's happening along the street edge. They've obeyed some planner's dictate saying that they need to have transparency or at least translucency. 
except there's just a door on either end, and you can't get in here. So nothing's happening on the street. As Yangel would point out, you know, people are even moving more swiftly along the street, and they're less happy here than they are here, where it's active, it's fine-grained, it's slow. I think another po important point to mention is that um, research from Canada shows that older adults get older and they die more quickly when they live in environments where there are fewer destinations to walk through. So I'm not just talking happy hugs here. This is in some ways an issue of your right to the city. It's an issue of human rights, right? Who should be able to, to access the city in a healthy way? Okay, one other issue though, I told you cities influence the way we treat each other. And I wasn't finding enough evidence out in the field from real scientists, so I thought, what the hell, I'll do another experiment. And in Seattle, I worked with an NGO called FutureWise, and what we did is we convinced their volunteers to pose as stupid lost tourists. And um, this is a, a very intelligent woman pretending she's a stupid lost tourist. So she's got the map up, and we, we moved them around the city, and we watched how people treated them. She clearly needs help or needs to be robbed, right? <laughs> So what we found was this, uh, people were much more likely to help without requests for help. Our lost tourists in this fine-grained environment, again, small shops, services, slow, although kind of gritty and kind of junky, than they were here in blank environments. They were more likely to lend their cell phone. They were even more likely to take our lost tourists where they wanted to go. Uh, and then, of course, they had to do the reveal and people were pissed off. But, <laughs> Anyway, the point is, these environments change everything, and so we come to the Bunnings for Arch Hill. Um, sorry, I was, I'm not trying to pick on Bunnings. Um, however, I just wanted to, I, I googled, you know, a blank uh, facade in Auckland, and this is what I found. Anyway, <laughs> I think we all have a right to be concerned about uh, uh, big retailers when we are in re-inhabiting central cities. Retail is coming back downtown, which is a great thing. But we need to demand more of these retailers. Okay? So this is a very dangerous environment in that it's killing, killing, killing the street edge. I don't know what they ended up with at the end of this process, but yuck. Uh, so it doesn't have to be this way. Don't start clapping. You're from Arch Hill, aren't you? So um, an example from Vancouver. Again, um, uh, Grosvenor Properties, a huge developer, wanted to bring a Home Depot to South Canby near our city hall. Home Depot is a big box retailer, you know, just the thing urbanites, urbanists are supposed to hate. And so the uh, planners said, cool, Home Depot's awesome. You can come, but you put it up on the second story. In fact, you can add another big box on top of that if you want, and let's put some condos on top of that, and let's let them, let them have a herb garden on top of that with lots of kale. The key is, um, you must line the street edge with active, uh, active activity, uh, small-scale retail. So you have nine uh, businesses along the street edge. So what do we know about this? It has created a healthier place, a more walkable place, a more social place, a happier place. And if our research in Seattle is right, maybe even a kinder place. And P.S., it's good for business. A representative of, of Grosvenor told me years later that they were so grateful the city forced them to do this. Why? Because they're making more per square foot off the small spaces. So sometimes developers who, you know, are frankly, they're the ones shaping our cities. Um, we need to push them harder to, to do what's good for us, but also good for them. I want to loop back to Chicago. This is really important. I told you the one thing the dead in Chicago during the heat wave had in common with social isolation. Well, there was something else going on. Urbanism was happening to them. So you take two poor neighborhoods in Chicago. One was a neighborhood with a you know, fine-grained fabric, small mom-and-pop shops, services, walkable places. Another one had probably been you know, brutalized by the mid-century modernists, sorry, the high modernists, and, uh, and uh, didn't have those opportunities. Guess what? The heat deaths were 10 times higher in the environment that didn't offer walkability and sociability. Why? Let me reverse that and speak positively. <laughs> the walkable social environment actually got people out of their houses. They were connecting with their neighborhood, older people, more vulnerable people. They had social support that the other group didn't have. 
So talk about an issue of, uh, of public health. This is also, again, a question of human rights. Who has the right to an urban environment that gives support and nurturing and care? Um, because we're in Auckland, because you're doing so much now with transportation, in some ways, I just want to touch on this notion of freedom. And when I'm talking about freedom, I'm talking about how you move through your city. So we know uh, in the Netherlands, but this is also true elsewhere, people who move by their own power, cycling and walking, especially cycling though, are reporting more joy and less fear, rage, and sadness than any other uh, commuters in the city. So that makes you think, geez, shouldn't we promote that way of moving? Or shouldn't more people do it? Well, here's the problem. 60% of people in cities say they would really like to try biking in the city. By the way, you have a 1% mode share here in Auckland. You know, so why aren't people doing it? I'm assuming Auckland is like Portland and elsewhere, where people are like, yeah, I want to try that, but no way, too scary. Why is it too square, scary? Well, look at this dude. He's between 20 and 45, I believe. And he represents the group of people who are willing to cycle on roads as you have them now. Uh, there's a fancy name for this group of people. I just call them the kamikazes. I used to be one. Um, so people aren't going to do it. Forget it. You know what else they're not going to do? This. Bike lane out in traffic? No. Shero? Are you crazy? No. Scary. Auckland bike lane. <laughs> okay. Um, when are people who are, are a little cautious, when are they going to start biking? When are they going to enjoy that freedom and joy and sociability that cyclists tend to enjoy? When they get safe, separated infrastructure or where streets are slow enough. Right? Our brains won't let us do it any other way. So, uh, oh, geez, there's your network in Auckland. Um, you know, um, the guys at uh, Auckland Transport blog have been trying to um, hook me up with some images of the networks. And, you know, even this isn't quite doing it because this included your includes your painted bike lanes. So okay, painted bike lanes, just they don't count. If you want to offer everybody freedom, they don't count. But anyway, you gave me this map and told me to get around Auckland. I'd be like, mm, okay, I'll take a cab. So I wanted to show you a map of what's absolutely possible. And I couldn't find it. I wanted a map of Copenhagen's uh, bike lane network. And you know what? It's so fine-grained that uh, it'd just be a mess on the screen. So instead, I got this map of Copenhagen's um, bike superhighway network. So for people to bike in from the suburbs, because, you know, like Auckland, most people's commute is less, uh, more than half of people's commute is less than five kilometers. So that's an easy bike ride uh, if it's safe. If you have this safe network, this social network, where incidentally so many people are biking now in Copenhagen, I think they have more than 50% mode share, they're double widening the bike routes. Why? The transport uh, manager told me a couple years ago, he's like, well, uh, the commute should be a social act, shouldn't it? People should be able to bike beside each other. And, uh, and chat on their way in. I thought, how cool is that? Well, the only way you get there is by building the infrastructure. Um, I'm just, here's a test. Uh, does anybody see anything unusual about this picture? <laughs> just shout it out. Smiling. They're smiling. Yes. Uh, in fact, um, as you saw in the diagram before, um, you know, transit users around the world tend to report the lowest levels of satisfaction with their journeys. Um, and that's usually because they're treated as second-class citizens, their buses are stuck behind cars, uh, because their systems are underfunded, etc. So let's just accept that for a second. Transit can be a wonderful experience, but let's accept that you know, sometimes it's not great. Even so, we're learning this. Transit makes people happy, even when they don't like taking it. Why is that? This is a longitudinal study from the UK. And what they did was, instead of just asking people if they liked their commute, they studied them over years. They took their responses, and what they found was, by asking the life satisfaction question, how happy are you with your life? They learned something really unique. Drivers who switched to active modes of traveling started reporting being much happier with life after the switch. And that includes those who switched to transit. So you're thinking, well, why? Why transit? Pretty simple, because transit is not just transit. Transit is always a walk or a roll, and then transit, and then another walk. 
So walking, you know, walking is the magic of our cities. So the question is, when you're planning your new robust transportation network in this city, what you really need to think about is how friendly is it to walkers? Does it reward people for walking? And I got to say, your shared streets are awesome. Um, look at these tourists dancing with the cars down, um, I don't know, Ludo, what's the street? Fort? Fort. Port. Fort. 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 Fort, yes. Anyway, it's a street. Um, <laughs> um, fantastic. A sense of freedom and reward for people moving in this way. Uh, Luke, he's a fast runner. So I want to show this picture because in Auckland, it seems to be that you're experiencing that same tension and the same tragedy as we see in cities all over the world. You're re-inhabiting the core. You're investing in the core. You're rewarding people for living with more connected density. And yet, out on the fringes, people are suffering this is terrifying for two reasons. Number one, uh, cars aren't slowing down. Number two, as I understand it, you have a law which basically says pedestrians have to give way to traffic. So uh, you basically, uh, drivers legally have the right to just run you over out there. And it's unfair and it's wrong. Who's it unfair to? Not just activists who want to be out there pretending to be tough guys. I, I'm not talking about you, Luke, because I admire you running across that street if you're here. Um, but to anybody who isn't an incredibly fit and brave person between the ages of, you know, 15 and, and uh, you know, 70 or 80. Lots of people just can't do that run. So who's your city for? And why aren't we creating those spaces for those people everywhere, even on the fringes? You know, it's, it's a decision. It's a political decision. And to illustrate that point, this is my second to last story. I have no idea what time it is. Um, is this. You've built hundreds of new communities in the last few decades, and you're going to be building hundreds more for hundreds of thousands of people. So every time we build a new community in the core or in the, the suburbs, we have a choice. Who's that community for? What do we value? So I went to a place in Germany where they made a decision about who, that, who the community is for. The community is for everybody. They value everyone, including this kid. Are there parents in the room? Put up your hands, please. Okay, um, keep your hands up if this picture freaks you out a little bit. Yeah, okay, you had to think about that. So he's five years old. He lives in Vauban, outside of Freiburg, Germany. Uh, it was an experimental community, and yes, he's biking to school. I biked with him. We got there, him and his mom, and uh, as we arrived, he said to me in German, I got a translation, uh, tomorrow, it was the first day of school, tomorrow I'm going to bike to school on my own. I'm like, nice, nice job, Sonny. That's not going to happen. And his mom turned to me. She said, yeah, now he knows the route. No problem. Why is that okay? In this village, the speed limit is five kilometers an hour. Five. Why is that? Because uh, it's hard to hurt someone at that speed. It's hard to scare someone at that speed. There's another thing going on in Vabon. Um, they've recognized that car ownership is very expensive. And it's time to internalize the costs of car ownership rather than transferring them that cost to everybody else in society. So if you move there and you own a car, you got to pay 20,000 euro for a spot in the parkade at the edge of the village, five minutes walk from your house. You're not allowed to park at home, okay? Um, if you don't own a car, like many young people in this city, you don't have to pay to buy a parking spot. You can spend 5,000 euro and buy a share of the park in the middle of the village. So what happens when we create a system where we've... <clears throat> internalized externalities. Well, a big thing that happens, other than people saving money, is this. People start their day with a short walk to the tram, to the parkade, uh, or a bike ride to school. Every journey begins with that walk. It's just a little bit further than some people in Auckland who are just walking to the garage. And it creates a tremendous sense of ease and conviviality. It's a really great space, place to start the day where kids have as much freedom as those of us who have power and run the economy. That doesn't include me. Um, so, you know, we can have that if we want it. We can have it if we've got the guts. You just need to start with one experiment, taking from Ludo's playbook. Um, oh, darn, I said I was going to... Can I give you some evidence before wrapping up Jan Semen, poor Jan Semenza's story? Five minutes of evidence here. Um, because at this point, 
you know, you leave tonight, you'll be in the bar and you'll say, yeah, we're going to make a happier city. And then you run into some elected official or some uh, uh, hard-nosed economist who say, what are you talking about? We have other priorities. We need to worry about the economy. We need to keep taxes low. We need to provide affordability, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And to those people, you can say that everything you would do to build a happier, more social, more connected, healthier community is also good for the bottom line and is great for business. I'm going to give you a couple of quick examples. What if we treated our urban land like farmers treated their fields? In other words, you measure productivity per acre or hectare here. So Joe Minikazi did this in Asheville, North Carolina, because he was trying to convince their downtown that maybe they should invest in their downtown. And what he found was this. Uh, the mixed-use development downtown provided the city with almost 100 times the tax revenue per acre. So it's, uh, acre is a little bit less than a hectare, right? And uh, more than 10 times the number of jobs per acre than the Walmart on the city edge. So I know that cities don't collect uh, um, sales tax here. So the translation for New Zealand is you'd be collecting about 10 times the tax per acre or hectare, whatever, uh, on your uh, connected uh, medium density development than you would if you're shoveling it into the edge, like we see the big boxes. Is it, is it called Westgate? Uh, amazingly, Westgate, the big boxes went in first, and uh, then the urbanism is sort of left for later. Um, anyway, the point is, there's money in this, there's tax revenue in this, and, and there's terrible danger if you don't pursue this kind of thinking. We know now the American cities that kept building on the edge uh, in this suburban Ponzi scheme have now, like Stockton, gone bankrupt because they weren't earning enough in development charges to support this uh, very expensive edge development. That's one thing, okay? The next thing is this. Um, when, every time we make a journey, it costs us, it also costs society. So it's important that we start to understand who is subsidizing whom when we're talking about your transportation budget. So my friends in Vancouver at Discourse Media who understand data and number crunching, and I don't, uh, have a great thing called the Commuter Calculator in their site called Moving Forward. Look it up. It's very cool. So what they've did is punch in all these externalities to find out the societal cost of each journey. So this is my journey. Uh, it's about a 5K uh, trip for work for me from East Van to downtown. Um, if I walk to work, I'm saving society. My journey is saving society a dollar eight. Why? Low infrastructure costs, and it makes me healthier, so I'm going to be less drag on the healthcare system and less uh, uh, congestion. If I bike, again, low infrastructure costs. Uh, makes me healthier. It's a bit worse than uh, walking because uh, there's a slightly higher uh, danger of an accident that which might cause uh, society, uh, cost society money. If I'm taking the bus, here's a remarkable number, and I hope Auckland Transport can pick this up. Because I live in a fairly dense area, uh, and the, there's a lot of people on that bus, what I pay in bus fare, um, exceeds the cost of providing me with that journey in infrastructure and operating costs. So my bus trip is going to subsidize bus trips and drivers in the suburbs of Vancouver. They're very welcome to that money. Um, if you drive, because society is paying immense infrastructure costs and is paying immense health care costs because you're not getting moving around actively and paying much higher accident costs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's costing society $2.78 to make that five-kilometer journey. Anyway, my point is we need to be uh, thinking about how everything is connected to everything else, every action in the city, every investment in the city. The happier, greener way of moving is also costing society less. So Auckland, as you pour money into com completing your, uh, your freeway uh, network, you need to think about how much this is actually costing taxpayers. Okay, one more example, quickly, Portland brought in a gro growth boundary um, more than 20 years ago, and now we know that in Portland, there are more restaurants and uh, also breweries per capita than any other city in the United States. Why is that? Are you going? <laughs> Bye. <laughs> and I'm going to wrap up, don't you worry. Um, why? Okay, so they brought in the gro growth boundary, and what the, you can go, Susan. <laughs> Susan Quinn is leaving now. I'm teasing. <laughs> Thank you for everything, Susan. It's been a great program. 
Um, Okay, so I'm sorry, by bringing in the growth boundary, Portland is growing more internally, and what that means is Portlanders are driving 20% less than other Americans. They're saving a billion dollars a year. And that's money they're not sending off to some foreign oil company or car company. It's money they're spending locally, that goes to local business, and they're getting very drunk on their microbrews because of it. So it's good for the economy, it's good for the bottom line. But I want to leave you with my one last story, because I promised you a happy ending, and that is this. Um, remember Jan Semenza and his um, harrowing journey through living in the United States and dealing with these heat deaths in Chicago? You know, he moved through the United States uh, for several years before settling in Portland, and that's when Americans usually start to laugh. Um, but he, in fact, moved to a very unhappy neighborhood in Portland. Uh, he told me that uh, in his neighborhood, I think it was called Yam Hill, Sunnyside, um, uh, very low social trust, cars were uh, shortcutting through their neighborhood, uh, neighbors didn't know each other, people didn't like each other, there were drug dealers on the streets, and the addicts were like defecating in his backyard. You know, he was just done. And then he heard about something magical that happened on the other side of town. And that magical thing was this. Residents of a neighborhood called Selwood got tired of that same experience, that same sense of disconnection. They had no public spaces. They didn't know their neighbors. People were bombing through their neighborhoods. A kid got hit by a car. And they said one day, you know, they had enough. They want their own gathering space. They want a community center. And they said, well, why can't we just turn our, our intersection into our own public piazza? They marched out onto the pavement. Being hippy-dippy Portland, it was all crazy colors and flowers and cob benches on the edges and there were kiosks where there was always a, a hot thermos full of uh, water. You could make some tea for yourself or a friend. You know, it was all very hippy-dippy. Um, and it was so, it, it so impressed Semenza that, you know, he wanted his own piazza. Interestingly enough, when these people marched out into their intersection without the support of the city, the first thing that happened was an engineer came down from City Hall and he's like, you people realize this is public space, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, that means no one's allowed to use it. Well, anyway, um, so they didn't sandblast it. They got the support of the mayor, and now these programs are, are propagating throughout the city with the city's support. So Semenza went back to his own neighborhood, and he said, you know, a piazza is going to save us people. He reached out to his neighbors. Um, what is this? Uh, bonding, social capital. They worked together. They reached out further to convince other people to buy into their system. They fought about it for a year. Somebody didn't like the idea of a honeysuckle bush in the corner. You know how neighborhoods can be. Um, and then finally the day came where they built their piazza. There's their big flower. And they even built this tremendous, huge um, uh, wrought iron gazebo. And one neighbor, he's a neighbor who neighbors like to share when they know each other, said, hey, I've got a backhoe. I'm going to bring it down here and we can lift the gazebo with my backhoe. And Semenza is like, no. After what he had been through in Chicago, he knew it was all about working together, bringing people together. So they lifted that gazebo together and somebody put their back out, probably. And, you know, it, they had a great time. They had a party. And the entire time this was going on, his students in public health were studying the effects of this and other intersection repairs. And what they found was at each repair, wherever communities got together to create their own public space, to fight the city, to build something of their own, there was a blast radius of positive psychological health. People reported life uh, was getting easier. They had uh, less trouble sleeping. Crime went down. Uh, people knew their neighbors. It changed everything in their lives. So that's evidence. But the funny thing is, Semenza, being an epidemiologist, you know, should have been guided by evidence, but he didn't need it anymore. You know, he felt it in his soul. He'd finally, finally come home to his own, well, I'll brand it, his own happy city, right? You know, he felt great. And he's now prescribing this as a climate change adaptation strategy in Europe because it's a way of bringing people together in communities of help. So I mentioned that last story to make the point again that Urban design, city spaces and systems, they really do change the way we feel, they change the way we move, and they change the way we treat each other. So the happy city really is a more healthy city, it's a more resilient city, it's a more sustainable city, but above all, it is a social city. And we can all have it 
But the way to get it is by working together with your allies to demand it and to help build it yourself. And the great news is, uh, according to the behavioral economics, is that uh, there is no better way to build happiness into your own life than, to working, with, than working with your allies on a cause that's bigger than yourself. And what could be a more important cause than building health, happiness, and love into your own city? I look forward to hearing how you're doing that here in Auckland. And thank you so much for having me. Stick around. Absolutely. We're just going to have a, um, do you want a little break, a, a, a breath. Um, I'm fine. Charles, that was great and um, thought-provoking and, and stimulating. It was a bit of a high octane kind of uh, guy. I feel like I've lost a pound of uh, fat, so um, it's, it's probably a good thing for me. Um, look, uh, what we'd like to do, would you mind taking some questions from the floor? And sure. uh, we'll try and see if we can manage these together. So okay. let's... Um, Is there a mic out there? There is a few roaming mics. So that's where Susan wasn't. She wasn't leaving. Okay. She was going to walk around with a microphone. You. <laughs> so look, I can't see a thing. Okay, lady at the front there who went first. Hello. Hi. And that was a marvellous talk today. Thank you. I really appreciate that. But you didn't mention anything about old people. Yes, and I you did. Stick, and you stick them in villages here. And then they get so they can't move out very well. Mm -hmm. And they haven't got connections with people around them so much. And they're stuck there perhaps mostly looking at a, perhaps a nice view if they're lucky, otherwise at four walls. Mm. Now we need to be able to get out and get around. So we need transport that we can get around and to be able to it's, you can't confine us to walking all the time. People may have disabilities, temporary or otherwise. So what are you going to do about those? Because they don't quite fit the rest of the plan. Thank you. I, I think it's a great point. So somebody trained me in some sensitivity workshop to refer to um, seniors as older adults. So that's what I called you before. I, I'm not sure if you're a senior or not. Okay, great. Um, okay, here's what I know. I agree with you completely that uh, not everybody is going to be able to get around on public transit. Uh, however, the longer people are able to do that and the longer people are able to reach destinations on foot, as they are in my own neighborhood, where you know, I'm a five-minute walk away from everything, it means you will stay healthier longer, you'll live longer, you'll stay more socially co connected longer. So I, I'm not even sure if you're able to imagine the kind of place I'm talking about because I haven't seen that in the, in the suburbs here. I, maybe I've just missed it. But I'm talking about a place where you come out of your building and it's all there for you. It's right there. Everything is there. Um, of course our neighborhoods need to be connected with really robust, easy transit, frequent service. That only comes with more connected density. And yeah, my mom is 86 years old and she drives because it's the only way for her right now. Um, so wouldn't it be great if more people could get off the road so there's room for you and your car? So I, I think the idea is to, to bring more complexity into our systems so there are choices for everyone. Um, the idea of that village, it just sounds quite horrible to me though. I'm, I hope you're not there yourself. <laughs> oh good. But, Mm -hmm. I've heard the same. Yeah. Thank you. That's a fantastic question. There's a, a, um, a lady here in the middle. Um, I, I just wanted to say to you, to the lady who's, who's um, spoken over there, that um, I'm a member of the Auckland Seniors Advisory Panel, and we're on to that. And, and so I, I um, know that the World Health Organization has got a um, whole health policy um, framework that looks at um, age-friendly cities, and I was wondering how much of your work has actually intersected with that policy framework, or if you're aware of it. 
Yeah, so uh, we did some work with the uh, European um, WHO, their Healthy Cities Network, and we're just starting a process with them uh, where we are um, essentially helping members of their network tackle their local um, health issues, and this includes uh, uh, planning for um, uh, older adults, um, through the happiness lens. And we find this is effective because um, it's kind of a sexy brand, it cheers people up. So rather than talking about um, simply health risks, we talk about the happiness benefits that come up with these very same policies that they want to pursue anyway. So we've just begun that process. I think there are, some of their measures and prescriptions are robust, and uh, we just want to remind them that we're, we're talking about everything that matters in life. It's not just living longer. Charles, you've got some um, workshops with the What's Matter Health Board, haven't you? Uh, later. Uh, yeah, on the 22nd, we're having a workshop. Uh, again, I, are we going to be speaking? Lester's going to come and okay. uh, give the vote of thanks. Oh, great. Okay, but good. Because uh, Lester could answer some of the questions if there's something yeah, that comes. Yeah, if you want to sure. jump in and talk about what's happened with you. So uh, next week, there's a workshop involving, uh, first of all, um, Rob Mayo's design, uh, uh, urban design students, uh, the health district, and Auckland Transport about how to get people moving from Grafton Station to the hospital because it seems like a lot of people who arrive at that station don't even know the hospital's there or vice versa. And um, uh, there's so much foot traffic that could occur there making people healthy as they get to the hospital. I think that encompasses it. Okay. That's great. Thank you, Charles. There was a um, question in the middle there. There's a gentleman with the, with the microphone. <laughs> uh, hey, um, so I'm a smug tower dweller. Uh, and I, I found, I suppose I found the question interesting about, you know, there's these areas which are really bad for social health, cohesion, I suppose, so tower blocks and the fringe. The, the problem, I suppose, is that they exist. And the solution you're kind of proposing of, like, you know, changing that seems to be to get rid of them. No. Um, or, or in some ways. Well, I suppose, what would be your solution for towers be, in a sense? Because towers will always have you know, 300, 400 people living in them mm -hmm. um, and would not necessarily have that space where you do meet your neighbours as often. Yeah. I, thanks I, for giving me a chance to clarify that. I believe what we need in our cities is more choice, more opportunity. In so many cities, you have a choice between the tower block and a single-family home in a car-dependent community, and there's very little in between. This is often the case in, in American cities. <clears throat> and I think here in Auckland, for example, you have these growth plans, and I understand the plans themselves are robust. They're talking about transit-oriented development. That doesn't always mean a tower, right? You can have row houses, townhouses, courtyard developments. Um, there's so many choices in between. Unfortunately, we went, moved so quickly in North America that what we're having to do now is what we call sprawl repair, is going in and repairing these communities, say, taking an um, underperforming gigantic mall site and punching roads through that site so we have it in a public realm again and can build a connected community there. But there may be those opportunities here. I do know some of you, around Trump, some of your rail stations, uh, you have all this underperforming land that could be developed in, in a variety of ways, and I'm curious to see why it's not happening. Charles, there's a, well, I'll take two more questions. There's one over there. I just want to, just one thing, you, you talked about density, and in, in Auckland there's been a fear of density. Uh, density is a bad thing, and it's primarily because it's been done so badly mm. in the past. There's a leaky, hip, leaky buildings process. There have been sort of developments with which are high, tall, dense, but mm. there's been no, been no community built into that process. So mm. density doesn't, isn't a bad word. It just hasn't been delivered well. So we do need those exemplars, and that's what the projects like the CRL, for instance, is going to start to unlock these sites across the region. Mm. And above that, those stations, we will build those sort of connected five-minute villages and walkable neighbourhoods. So it's a long journey that we're kind of on. But the thing about interesting about density is that uh, Sydney, for instance, is something like double the density of Auckland in terms of its, its highest density. Mm. London is six times the density of Sydney. Mm. Barcelona is six times the density of, of, uh, of London. You know, it, it, these, these places are great, vibrant places, and yet we shouldn't be... It's just about how you do it. It's not the drinking, it's how we drink. <laughs> and I think uh, we've got to do that. The great design is, is the key, so mm. that's the way of moving forward. But um, two, another two questions, and then we'll, we'll probably end. So, lady, um, gentleman. <laughs> Sorry, sir. Um, yeah, my question is around uh, big block retail and uh, malls, if you like, and what is... And, you know, give, given all the 
negative externalities that are there that occur from their development, the, the travel, the lack of, the, I guess, the, the degradation to, of local community, when people drive to shop in, in, in these malls. What is, the, in your view, the best way to man manage that development in a, in a city? I think it's time uh, that uh, cities like Auckland work to internalize some of the external costs of these developments. So again, you know, I'm not an expert on the intricacies of what has happened when here and, not even, and even your policy frameworks. But um, I'm curious to see what the development charges are uh, for some developments, places like uh, in Westgate, where uh, the plan may be great, but what's going in there first uh, have been the big boxes. And we do know that there are huge costs associated with them, right? The transportation costs, infrastructure costs, health costs. <clears throat> so you're at this quite amazing time. I know affordability is an issue, but the fact that it's now getting expensive here means there's money on the table and there is demand, and you can harness this demand to ensure that the best places get built first, not kick down the, uh, kick down the road for later. Anyway, I, Ludo, you may have a comment on this. I don't know if you're dealing with the real estate office and their policies around development charges, but it should be very expensive to build a big box in, um, in dispersal. Yeah, got a big question to, towards the end, isn't it? Um, in, in the UK, interesting enough, they had a planning policy guidance six, which was brought out in sort of late 1990s, which outlawed out-of-town big box retail mm -hmm. developments. Uh, they, they stopped that. You know, there was a concept of building on the outside of cities mm -hmm. and then building a, a bypass route which would take you to those places and then say, hey, hey presto, the town centre died. Mm -hmm. And so um, Auckland has a chance, and I think the point is that you just mentioned, we are at a crossroads here. We have never been a, a united city. Mm -hmm. We have always had uh, eight competing city establishments who all did their own thing under, without a coordinated one plan. A lot of these developments we're talking about were consented or conceived 15 years ago and they're all being built out. Mm -hmm. The difficulty now for the team and for the council is to retrofit these places. Mm -hmm. They've already been built, so you don't want to just leave them. I mean, Obama talked about actually um, uh, flattening large parts of suburbia in the states because it was unviable in his early, in his early campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, we can't, we're not doing that. We're <laughs> having to rebuild those places, mm -hmm. make them mixed use. But you're right, the, the, the order is important. Mm -hmm. um, but we are seeing um, big box players come into city centres and there's mm. the Soho development in Ponsonby with the, uh, the Countdown Progressive. We see a, uh, a, a new metro on Queen Street un under the city, under an old bank. Mm. Uh, Countdown is in uh, Victoria Street. So we are seeing these places, but Auckland has, has had laissez-faire planning for so long and we're going to have to start to make the right decisions and it's going to take time. So people are quite impatient and um, mm. it is complex, but there is an issue of... Um, of awareness and education. Mm -hmm. um, you see the Bunnings store in Melbourne has residential on top of it. They can do it in Australia, mm -hmm. just a few thousand miles away. Um, what about Auckland? Don't we deserve better? So um, it's an educational process as much as anything. So mm -hmm. there's a challenge there too. The rules and the carrot. So um, is that um, Susan? <laughs> I, Last question. Okay, Charles. Um, I have seen, we've driven around um, Auckland last week and seen the terrific job that Ludo and the team from Auckland Council are doing on the, in the city centre where there are external economies of scale and critical mass. Um, I'm interested to know how do you apply that uh, to a, an area I represent over the bridge in Birkenhead where it's a small economy and we've got a critical tension between some of the policy about shared spaces but needing the cars to drive through in order for those economies to survive. So what's the dynamic there in terms of how do you translate that to a smaller environment? Yeah, it's challenging and I've seen examples um, of uh, suburban retrofits, uh, effective ones, particularly in, in the United States. Um, you know, every jurisdiction is different, every city is different. Um, so I can throw some examples at you uh, that I think were effective. Um, Smyrna, Georgia, they had um, an underperforming downtown while the, while the big boxes were sucking all the businesses away. They used eminent domain, actually, and they uh, basically bought up uh, what had been their downtown, which was just a mess in the end, and they redeveloped it. They called it like the Market Village or something, you know, kind of faux heritage environment, Main Street, Disneyland-ish, uh, and super effective. 
people wanted to be there. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't scary. Um, I know it's not like you need to immediately jump into a shared space environment. It takes humans to uh, slow the cars down. Otherwise, it's not really a shared space, right? So I think um, if there can be vision at the local level where you create some kind of a, an attractive anchor, whether that is one special street or one, whether it's one special attraction, and you um, create a kind of a, a sexiness and a high status demand around that way of being. Interestingly, in Smyrna, they did it. It's beautiful. People want to be in that environment. Um, but the mayor's mom lives just around the corner from this new, wonderful uh, downtown-like street. And when she wants to go shopping, someone's got to drive her because um, they didn't create uh, a residential environment, or sorry, a, a shopping environment close enough to this area because uh, for aesthetic reasons, actually. So um, think complexity, think getting all the pieces in place. Anyway, that's just one example. It can be done, you know, there is not going to be room for everybody downtown. So um, I think if you have the vision and the boldness, you can attract those people to, you, to your um, town center as well. Fantastic. Look, I just want to thank you very much, Charles. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to um, have a vote of thanks and uh, from uh, Dr. Lester Levy. Um, just as Lester comes to the stage, I just thank you for the time for being here. Thank and you. It's been really, you've been fantastic, great guy. And um, it's a real pleasure and privilege to be um, here with you. So would you mind putting your hands together for Charles? Thank you. What we thought we'd do was um, ask um, somebody who's uh, probably, uh, probably the most, one of the most... Uh, well, have a seat down there, Charles. Thank you. Um, a really appropriate man to uh, give the vote of thanks today is a, a triple chairman, I suppose, of the, of the Watamata, the, um, the Auckland District Health Board, and also Auckland Transport. So uh, Dr. Lester Levy is the most appropriate person, we thought, to uh, bring the, the session to a close. So, Lester, thank you for coming and being here, and uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, it really falls to me a, a pleasurable task uh, to um, extend a vote of thanks to Charles. Uh, Charles, you are a um, gifted communicator. You are a wonderful storyteller. Uh, but more than that, um, we really thank you for coming all this way to um, challenge our assumptions, uh, rip apart our paradigms, uh, reveal the reductionist thinking that has uh, gone in the past and still is with us. Uh, but to carry some very serious messages, uh, we are relational people, human beings, and uh, so much has been done to diminish that. And I really want to do, uh, thank you by um, using a, um, uh, a story from uh, long time in my life ago, um, I've been in New Zealand for three and a half decades, but I originally came from South Africa. And in South Africa, when you go past a Zulu person, they do not say hello or good day to you. Not that they're unfriendly. They will say, sawa bona. And directly translated, it means, I see you. And you will not re respond by saying hello or good day to them you would say Sakona, which means directly translated and from Zulu is I am here. This is a weird kind of greeting. I see you. I am here. It's as if unless you see me, I do not exist. And this is the reality of a Zulu um, philosophy called Ubuntu, which is a philosophy of relational interdependence, which Charles has been talking to us about today. And it's characterized in a Zulu folklore saying, Umuntu Nagamuntu Nagabantu, which directly translated means a person is a person because of another person. So what is I see you? What does that actually mean? And how does I see you bring me into existence? And I see you means I acknowledge you, I recognize you, I'm fair to you, I help you, I'm friendly to you. And Ubuntu is a philosophy of happiness. And it's quite intriguing being invited here tonight because um, at the Waitamata District Health Board, which is the biggest district health board in New Zealand, we have recently launched a campaign that we want to be not the best DHB or the biggest DHB or whatever. We want to be the friendliest DHB. Because what Charles has been talking to you about tonight is a reality. Happiness is really important. 
You know, and we aspire to be happy, but we are hardwired to be unhappy because of what we've done to ourselves. So I think what Charles has challenged us today is to realize that we don't have to be the receptors of everything, that, the receptor site of everything that is given to us. Uh, we can take a lot of initiative ourselves, and there are things that he described to us that we can do ourselves. So we're not helpless. So we can't sit around and wait for somebody to make these change. We need to be part of the change. But I really welcome what you've said. Um, I think we should all think about this, and these conversations are not something that we've just had. This is a conversation, is something that has been started and should continue. So on behalf of everybody here tonight, Charles, I'd like to thank you very much for your thoughtfulness, your courage, your boldness. You're a smart guy, and we welcome you and we thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>